Well, um, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, Nim, with Yanis and Elaine, and uh, Sam and Nathan and Alexia for, uh, yeah, for this invitation. And uh, um, for me, it was like uh, some sort of uh, throwback in time because like, they asked me to um, uh, include in the show a project which has like some years. Um, so uh, I took the chance uh, in this talk to somehow reflect on uh, uh, on this, uh, let's say, historical arc in which I was involved in what I would call experimental publishing. And the attempt today is somehow to um, systematize um, the, 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 my, my involvement in this and the kind of things that I've been following through this, uh, through this decade. Um, of course, <laughs> To compress like 10 years in, um, uh, in half an hour is like not, not a great idea. Uh, so uh, I also tried like, you know, a uh, pretty traditional way of, uh, of um, uh, preparing this talk, like writing a text, making slides. None of them felt really right. So um, I thought of trying something a bit more risky, but I hope it will work and will be interesting for you. And it's a sort of um, associative uh, history, uh, an exercise in memory. And this is the reason why I'm very happy that I attended uh, Anna's, uh, uh, Anna's workshop. Um, and there are some premises here that I, I would like to make. Uh, the first is that uh, uh, in trying to tell like a personal history, a sort of memoir of experimental publishing, um, uh, I realized that it's important to, to uh, clarify from the start that there is no uh, uh, linear history in this. There is no telos somehow. Uh, that um, a lot of uh, small ideas, small obsession of different artists uh, uh, emerged organically in, in different places and in different times. Um, so, um, also another realization for me was that uh, uh, projects are less important than these ideas. Also because um, some, many of the projects that I've included in the archive are s somehow not very much um, uh, let's say, uh, historicized and uh, uh, somehow celebrated, because a lot of them are, are very small things that happened in school, like, uh, uh, like a five-hour workshop in which a student had like, something brilliant that commented upon like, uh, an issue that is crucial to the discussion of publishing. So a bit of my effort with, uh, with the archive was somehow to uh, cherish these small, um, the small projects. And of course, in order to, um, to, to, to pay respect to this, I have to probably mention too many names, but I think it's very important to do this in, uh, in, uh, in yeah, maybe not, uh, not contextualizing necessarily everybody, but at least to mention their name. So I would really like to start uh, with how I got involved uh, in this. And before doing this, I would like to ask someone maybe to give me a five minutes heads up when I'm reaching uh, uh, the end. Yeah, because otherwise I might, uh, it might take forever. Again, as I said, like 10 years. Um, so uh, basically, um, all my interests uh, start a bit by chance in a way, because like, um, I'm a graphic designer by trade. And uh, I don't know how, but uh, I end up uh, in the Netherlands uh, doing an internship at the Institute of Network Cultures, uh, pr probably an institution that many of you, uh, many of you know. And um, uh, basically what I was asked to is uh, to set up uh, uh, all the print-on-demand section of, uh, uh, of the publishing house, of the Institute of Network Culture, which is run by, which is founded by Hert Lovin. Uh, what you see here in that picture is like a, a younger version of myself uh, uh, that is looking at this espresso book machine and this Maria Minaya is like explaining me what's, what's the process there. So basically the espresso book machine is a printer that you find that uh, 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 a bookshop in the center of Amsterdam. I don't know if it's still, it's still there, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, the amazing thing is that it's able to uh, not only print a book, but also to, uh, you know, to bound it in uh, less than 15 minutes. So it's a nice combination of like, the normal print-on-demand model in which like, you uh, uh, send a file and then the, you can, only print, uh, you can uh, also only print one copy and it's delivered to you. Uh, but also the possibility to actually see the machine and uh, have like a sense of place no, uh, in, this, uh, um, uh, in this kind of publishing process. 
Um, so I, basically I was asked to uh, test many of those platforms, some uh, uh, pretty much online like Lulu, and some like this, a bit hybrid. And uh, uh, the shift moment for me was like when um, basically uh, we started to receive these books and uh, basically thanks to the um, um, to a, a generous system of funding in the Netherlands, uh, institution are able, some institutions are able to distribute these books for free. So you can basically write an email and they will send this book to you. Um, and uh, uh, something that shocked me at the time was the fact that uh, uh, we found out while doing research that these books uh, were like resold for a higher price on places like eBay or Amazon. And I was very curious about the reaction of the, of the institution I was uh, uh, working with. And uh, basically there was like, uh, I would have expected, you know, some sort of uh, enragement or like a protectionist uh, approach to this. But instead they were amused by it. Uh, they were like checking the prices and saying, ah, this is going here and there. Uh, so the shock wasn't so much for like, let's say, um, the, the, the sort of ethos uh, of uh, free culture, which is still part of it, but also the fact that uh, there was a joy um, in, uh, in dissemination, in seeing where like the books go, uh, do, where do they end up. And for me, like as a graphic designer, was like um, a sort of uh, paradigm shift to understand that uh, you could think of books, um, the climax of the publishing process, not when you have the book in your hand, but when really is like going somewhere else. And uh, this can transform the book themselves, it can transform the publication. So a lot of publications were shaped by, uh, by this idea, at least like the ones I was interested in. Um, so uh, to go a bit into this notion of experimental publishing, so who started to uh, use this term? Um, I think one of the first people was Paul Solellis, um, an artist and uh, uh, designer from the US. He teaches at the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, his main project when he started to think uh, through this is like the library of the printed web, which uh, the basic idea is that um, he would collect all this publication in, in which like the content would be uh, let's say web native, uh, internet native. And of course in the act of uh, becoming books or set of postcards, um, a certain new meaning would be added to that. For example, imagine like a project in which, um, you know, like uh, uh, scenes from, from uh, a Google Street View becomes postcard. In that action, in that uh, uh, crystallization of something very fluid and dynamic like, uh, um, uh, like Google Maps, um, you, you, you are commenting on it, you are saying something more about it, so it's not just like a one-on-one -on -one thing. So according to Paul Solellis, um, uh, the, uh, speaking of, um, um, uh, of, of experimental publishing meant uh, um, dealing with a field that was like in constant uh, uh, expansions in which like new actors basically were uh, playing a role, like platforms for example. Um, and another thing that I think was crucial at the time was the reflection on the, on the, the public, the so-called, like traditionally called pub public sphere. So he would say, let's think, let's start with the idea of the post. Now, nowadays, if I say post, you would uh, Im Im immediately imagine, I don't know, a tweet or a Facebook post. But he would say, let's think of the post as like this note attached in a, um, in a, in a, uh, in a public square. Um, and he was asking a question which is still very relevant, which is, um, is posting always publishing? Um, is there like something that, uh, uh, some, some added value that uh, uh, the publishers and uh, the, the people involved in publishing can add? Um, of course, at the same time, in my own archive, which is called the Post Digital Publishing Archive, which you probably have seen in the show over there, um, I was also using the, starting to use the notion of experimental publishing. Uh, and uh, of course this idea of post-digital, which was also mentioned luckily by uh, Nathan, was really present uh, in like, yeah, um, what is it, like six years ago. Florian Kramer, uh, which is one of the main people who has been like spending time theorizing uh, around the notion of post-digital, uh, was saying something quite clear about it. Was saying like, uh, okay, um, Post-digital is a sort of uh, uh, aesthetics that uh, goes against uh, um, a certain uh, cleanness, uh, slickness of uh, smoothness of digital technology. And this is like, might, might seem obvious nowadays, 
Uh, but there was a lot of uh, misunderstanding at the time around post-digital because um, uh, it was like already a term, um, let's say, incorporated by marketers in order to say post-digital is simply like a combination of uh, digital and uh, physical elements. So there are other terms for that. So uh, the, the, the good contribution, the great contribution of Florian was somehow to say that there is like um, an ethics in this aesthetics, no? to uh, somehow reconsider what is like the digital experience. The other, uh, let's say, um, uh, yeah, um, uh, a really influential person in this, uh, in this debate was Alessandro Ludovico. The, his book is also here. Uh, and it's called post-digital print. Uh, here, um, he, he, his book can be seen as a sort of um, eulogy of print. Um, in fact, basically what he does in the book is to reconstruct um, uh, a sort of history of the fake hands of the book. B because um, since like the 18th century, people like, were like forecasting the disappearance of the, the printed book. And by making like this history, it was showing how absurd, how ridiculous is like this claim. Um, and uh, um, well, basically, to go back to the um, experimental notion, um, th there is something to say also in, in the context in which m most of this project emerged, uh, at least from my perspective now. Uh, which is the context of the Netherlands. Uh, of course, the Netherlands has, um, uh, from the perspective of graphic design especially, um, a sort of um, um, ethics of, uh, of uh, pushing the boundaries of disciplines. So, for example, a lot of graphic designers do performances and nobody knows exactly uh, where, like, you can say, okay, this is this discipline and this is the other, and it's beautiful. But, of course, there is also um, like, uh, there were like rents at the time. For example, Peter Billack, which is a type designer and graphic designer, was saying like, uh, uh, yeah, very few terms have been used so habitually and carelessly as the word experiment. Uh, because it was basically bringing back the idea of uh, uh, experiment in the, uh, basically in the scientific method idea, which means that you have controlled results, no? Um, but, uh, of course, uh, we can see that uh, um, somehow we can do this, uh, we, we can control the results, uh, or at least some of the results, again, in the retrospective. So that's why it's interesting to uh, read back a bit like this uh, micro history, basically. And uh, an example which I really like um, is, this, um, um, is this sort of tragedy in three links. Um, so Paul Solalis was uh, sharing for the first time uh, yeah, I'm sorry, it's, a, it's very small, but uh, let's see if I can... Oh, this is very big. Yeah, there is no in-between. Uh, I'm going to read it for you. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, I'm lost. Okay, yeah. Yeah, let's go back here. So basically, Paul Solalis was, uh, was using like a new platform to spread uh, his syllabus on experimental publishing, a platform called New Hive. Uh, one of these platforms that basically had allowed this uh, specialization of information, a bit like what I'm doing now. And Rosa, I was like doing digging in, the, uh, in a bit like the, the debate at the time. Rosa was saying, uh, well, look, maybe uh, to publish course content on a commercial unstable platform is not necessarily a choice for prosperity. I think you meant posterity, but like, you know, it's, 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 it's Twitter, it's like, we all know. Uh, and in fact, if you check nowadays like the platform, it doesn't exist anymore. Of course, you can retrieve the material, but you have to do a lot of effort. So you can see already um, emerging certain concerns of, uh, of durability, of resilience, maybe you would say, of, uh, uh, of digital content, which is also a politics of ownership, basically. Uh, so what was my take on, on this idea of, um, uh, of experimental publishing? Well. Um, through, the, uh, through the publishing lab, which was sort of a spin-off uh, of, uh, of the INC, we had, uh, of the Institute of, of Network Culture, we had the chance to work with, uh, you know, actual trade publishers, you know, to do um, sort of research and development for them. And uh, my realization was that uh, uh, there was like a total identity crisis of the field. 
So um, there was a sort of desperation in order, uh, because of course, like the, the, the revenues were like going down and uh, uh, you know, the, there was like competition with different media. So basically, a lot of publishers were uh, dropping a lot of money on like research and development in order to um, basically redefine their role, understanding who they were, wh who they were becoming. Um, so, um, our sense of experimental publishing was like this post-digital, let's say, critical engagement with technology. But on the other side, from the trade publisher perspective, there was really like uh, uh, an idea of chasing uh, uh, um, technological novelty. So whatever, whatever it, it had uh, a sense of uh, newness, was good to try, AR, VR, and so on, social reading, any label that you can imagine. Um, so uh, combining these two, uh, these two ideas, these two perspectives on experimental publishing, I was like uh, uh, suggesting that uh, um, you would have to have a sort of practical and zone approach uh, in which making produces meaning. It, and it's a bit what I was saying with the distribution. Um, and also I was writing something which I really, it really, I find it really embarrassing for the way it's written, but uh, yeah, it was different times. But I was writing like an inexorably impermanent antagonism towards the mediating forces of the hegemonic discourse. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I'm sorry for the, the pretentiousness of, of uh, but I was doing my PhD, understand me. Um, <laughs> So, um, so basically what I was trying to say that uh, uh, one shouldn't be limited to use the platform but to engage in the liminal spaces, in the gaps. Uh, and uh, those gaps are um, always changing. So for example, at the time there was a, a lot of um, Facebook art. It's ridiculous to say it right now like this, but uh, there were a lot of people testing the, the limits of uh, uh, of, of, of the platforms and for a moment uh, had like the capacity of uh, uh, you know uh, this, let's say ra raising awareness or like making something of the platform uh, visible but again like uh, with, with this kind of language I think we were a bit naive in the sense of um, uh, boosting a bit too much those little experiments would have been nicer maybe to to be a bit more humble in this sense uh, just a note um, on, the, uh, on some other experiences that are contemporary, that are still happening nowadays. Uh, there is a master uh, in, uh, in Rotterdam called XPUB uh, at the Pitzwart Institute and it's fully dedicated uh, to, to this notion of experimental publishing. And uh, they also insist of uh, uh, this dual uh, approach to um, uh, to, to, to technological framework, so inquiry, but also participation. What does participation mean? Uh, not only test, t testing the boundaries, but also building your own tools and contributing to tools that have like a chance to um, somehow uh, going, going against the status quo or like introduce different models. This very presentation is an attempt in this, even though now it's just a picture, but I use like a free software called uh, Pampot, like very recent. Uh, the beta was released a few months ago. It's basically a, normally a tool for uh, designing interfaces. Um, in that context, a lot is happening. So Adobe is losing a bit the monopoly, no? you know, with uh, uh, Photoshop and Illustrator. So there is a new war. And, uh, um, and uh, Pampot is like the, the floss, uh, the free and open source attempt to this. But again, like just before the presentation, there were like too many glitches. So now what you're seeing is just like an export that thank God I did just before, uh, just before. Otherwise I would have been like with an internal server error in front of, uh, in front of the screen. Um, there has been also, uh, I think, there has been a moment in which uh, this idea of experimental publishing became a bit tiring. Uh, and this is because of uh, something which I, call, I would call panthology. Um, so basically, it's a pathology that I see in many, uh, I think it um, emerges in many disciplines. And, and it's basically this. Um, you start to see every possible phenomenon through the lenses of your practice, of your lexicon, etc. Some example of, of this, like maybe the most, the main example of this, I would say, is cybernetics. 
no, which applied this uh, cybernetic lo logic to, to the brain, no, starting to say, okay, the, the brain works like a computer, the brain is a computer. Um, so at this very uh, moment, uh, when, when we bring it back to publishing, there were like people doing like, um, uh, I don't know, uh, food experiments and start to say, no, yeah, this is a publication. No, so uh, we, we lost a bit too much of, uh, uh, of, of, of like a scope. Um, so um, how to bring, it, to bring back like a meaning and a common goal, let's say. I would say uh, that some themes that are still uh, very valuable to explore are like the themes of uh, uh, amplification, uh, which is, uh, let's say, is like the added value that a publisher br brings to a uh, publication. No? It's like, how do you amplify it for uh, not just like this, uh, uh, this generic universal idea of the public, but how do you commit to specific uh, audiences? How do you speak, uh, speak to a uh, specific crowd? Um, and there was like uh, uh, someone called Matthew Stadler that uh, um, proposed like this understanding of, publica of the word publication as a verb, not just as making public, no? which is the dictionary def definition, but also as the making of a public. So how much of that effort uh, goes uh, unnoticed in the, uh, in, 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 in the publication process? And how can that process be, uh, be made explicit? And this is particularly crucial, I would say, nowadays, because um, I think in general we experience uh, um, a sort of retreat uh, from the idea that uh, uh, we publish for the whole world for, on a global scale. Uh, there is like uh, a form, um, uh, like let's say, five minutes, perfect. Um, there is like, uh, you know, this concept, uh, this old concept of the circles, you now like Google Plus, the idea that uh, uh, there is some enclosures of public as becoming also a way to, uh, to define autonomy. For example, uh, both on um, uh, the left side of the, spe the political spectrum, but also on the right. Think of uh, Truth, uh, the, 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 uh, the recently launch launched uh, social media by, by Donald Trump. Of course, there are, uh, maybe that's the most uh, 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 troublesome example, but there are also many other examples uh, uh, that you would place uh, on, the, yeah, on the left side of the political spectrum. I'm going to jump uh, this part since I have uh, only five minutes and just speak another bit uh, about this theme of uh, frugality. Um, again, like this goes hand in hand with, uh, with the notion of, um, um, of, of uh, uh, of distribution. Um, since like the publishers, uh, uh, the trade publisher were like injecting capital in publication experiments, uh, they were really uh, mesmerized by the shiny tech. No? So you had a lot of experiments for the iPad, uh, very heavy uh, digital books. They were like extremely uh, extremely unsustainable, also in terms of like global distribution, because like we speak of a, of an ebook of like one gigabyte. So uh, basically, if you if you didn't have like a decent uh, connection, you did, didn't really have access to this. Uh, and of course, brought with it like a lot of features that you can also see as a bug. You no, know? uh, so you had like push notification within like the the publication themselves. So the publication became like uh, some sort of operating systems. Um, and uh, uh, basically, at the time, I was writing about poor media. Um, the idea was inspired by, by the poor image of uh, Hito Steyer, no? Uh, and I, I want to give a couple of examples of this, uh, of like how poor media, uh, let's say, foster uh, di dissemination. So what you see on the left is the frontispiece of, uh, of, of Flatland, uh, you know, the novel uh, on, on many dimensions, typical reading of uh, graphic designers. Um, and it's basically a novel in which like, you, you have uh, different worlds with different amount of dimension. So a 3D world, a two-dimensional world, and a one-dimensional world. What you see on the, on the right, I'm sorry if like, it's, a bit, uh, yeah, it's a bit small, but it's basically it's the rendition of the same frontispiece of the book on the Gutenberg library, which is a, um, a library that allows, online library that allows you to, to download these books for free, basically. And uh, uh, there was a, limit, a technical limitation in the format, so you could only use uh, .txt at the beginning. So what you had to do is somehow to turn into ASCII 
uh, what was a very complex uh, drawing. And my argument was that uh, in the translation, you weren't just uh, uh, losing resolution, but you were adding something more, a sort of la historical layer, a layer of interpretation. So I was writing things like poor media foster duplication and boost circulation. They are lightweight, they suggest an active use. Um, uh, the poverty of poor media should be better called frugality, since it's ca characterized by the conscious re renunciation of embellishment in favor of accessibility and spread. The Spartan look of poor media might not be beautiful, but it's undoubtedly charming. Um, I conclude with, the, with this kind of uh, um, new, again, like a sort of uh, dialectic affinities of what I see right now happening uh, from this perspective. Clearly, um, my idea and, and the idea of many people working on this was um, a formal, an aesthetical approach to this idea of poverty of media. Uh, but nowadays, um, this a very similar idea is emerging from um, uh, a way more uh, socially conscious and political uh, perspective. So for example, what you see here is like, it's a website that is called, this is a motherfucking website. And it doesn't have any styling, no? So the idea is to say, look, you don't need to add a lot of um, bloatware, the so-called bloatware, to make it uh, working. Uh, the, the web was already thought in a way that uh, it would work without too much, uh, uh, too much heavyweight libraries and stuff like that. Um, so a, a sort of ecological conscience is growing around this idea of poor media, which of course uh, people have no idea that, uh, so, so here comes the Notellus part. People have no idea of this history, it's like from my perspective that I see this. Another nice example is like, uh, probably you all know that, uh, is the Low Tech Magazine. It's a blog that uh, uh, goes very in deep of what low, low tech can be. And recently, they, they made a, a version of the magazine which is uh, uh, solarly powered. Uh, so it, uh, it, is, it is hosted on a server in Barcelona. Uh, so whenever there is sun, uh, the server stays up. Uh, when, when the battery goes off, when too many people click, like, the website goes off. And those are like the, the limits that uh, uh, the website suggests. Um, and yeah. Basically, um, this implies also other uh, distribution choices, like uh, default fonts, um, uh, dithering on images, small images, and so on. Um, I think, yeah, I don't want to take uh, too much more time, but I would like to thank you for, for your attention.